five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey, space enthusiasts, we will be talking about the future of the space economy as well as geopolitics and exopolitics in this episode. By the way, yeah, you guessed it, exopolitics would be politics of Earth. I could not have a better guess for these topics. Dr. Pippa Morgren is a renowned economist who has, among many other roles, advised President George W. Bush. She recently published a couple of articles about space on her Substack. Our conversation spans everything, from Ukraine over space-based solar power all the way to aliens. You will not want to miss it. Enjoy. My name is Raphael Rodkin, and I'm an investor and advisor to space companies. Just as a reminder, this podcast is for informational purposes only, and nothing should be taken as investment advice. This podcast is sponsored by Nanoavionics, a satellite manufacturer and mission integrator. Their technologies enable many space companies worldwide to offer services that improve life right here on Earth, such as providing global connectivity, conducting Earth observation, or contributing to scientific discoveries. Check them out, and also check out my episode with the CEO and co-founder. Sadly, I am not a rocket scientist, but I'm an alumnus of the International Space University. ISU offers a number of educational programs about space worldwide. Check them out at isunet.edu. And just some final things before we start the episode about ourselves. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple or Spotify. If you want us help, expand our work, you can do so and support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. And we'll also put that link in the episode notes. And lastly, you can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Hello, everybody. Very excited to be back with another episode of the space business podcast. And as many of you longtime listeners know, even though it's called the space business podcast, Every few episodes, even I get bored with just the pure business stuff. So we need to invite very interesting people who are not, at least not 100% focused on business. So today it's my really big pleasure to have Dr. Pippa Mulgram on the podcast. And Pippa, I could not possibly do your background justice if I tried to introduce you myself. I would probably omit something. You get very upset with me. So oh, no. I'm going to cheat. Why can't I ask you to give sort of the short introduction to, to, to yourself, what you would like listeners to know about your background, please? Oh, well, first, thank you so much for having me. I'm really psyched. This is such a hot topic. So I'm an economist and uh, I advise governments. I used to work in the White House as uh, economic advisor to President George W. Bush, and I've advised the British cabinet. But I decided a few years ago, instead of just talking about the world economy, that I wanted to get involved in it. Uh, and I co-founded a robotics company that was making aerial drones, um, aerial robotics. And then I've most recently been involved in working with startups in all sorts of different sectors. But my core job is figuring out what's coming next. And I look for signals in the world economy that tell me about what the future holds it, I define signals as things that are not yet in the data. And I wrote a book called Signals about how you can see things even though the data doesn't tell you it's there yet. And I see so much happening in what I call the space space. And I've been writing about that and I'm very excited to talk about it today. So am I, so am I. And yes, you mentioned the space space. And, and by the way, you know, probably this is a joke in our sector, right? You can always tell, like, I know you did it on purpose and, and yeah. that's funny, but we can always tell people who are relative newcomers to our sector because they say like space <laughs> in space. Like, oh no, I said space twice. But you wrote a two-part, <laughs> I think so so far a two-part series uh, basically called the space space on your on your sub stack. And we're going to put a, a link to your sub stack in the episode now so people can check out. And I highly recommend people check out as many fascinating articles there, including the two on the space space. There are so many things going on in the world for somebody like you at the moment, like you know, certain geopolitical conflicts, the little thing called inflation in many places in the world. <laughs> what what made you write about the space space? Why now? Oh, this is a great question. Well, first of all, at this time with so many terrible things happening in the world economy, there's a loss of hope and a disbelief that the future might hold something better. So I'm always looking for where are there new sectors coming to life that people haven't understood yet. So clearly space 
uh, is one of them, and that covers so many different things. Second, um, I've long argued, and, and for background, I, I lecture at Sandhurst uh, to the generals. I occasionally brief the NATO generals. Mm -hmm. So my background is not just in economics, but kind of the nexus between uh, strategic security and the world economy, the sort of geopolitics and markets technology interface. And so I'm, I have personally argued that, well, we're, we're kind of already in World War III, but World War III is in many ways better than previous world wars because it's occurring in locations the public can't see. Mm -hmm. And one of them is space. And I think that we've seen the superpowers absolutely nose to nose in space for several years. And I put out an article, I think it was October 29th last year, arguing that World War III had really affected already begun. And for me, the date of that was not February, late February, when the Russian tanks rolled into Ukraine, but January 7th, which is when the announcement came that the most important internet cable in the world, in fact, mm -hmm. the fastest internet cable in the world, which is a double cable. It's a very yeah. rare double cable for redundancy. And it's in this tiny little island in the north of Norway called Spalbard. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, somehow I was aware, I knew that, that is that's the point of connection for virtually every satellite that's more than 5,000 miles high. Um, actually, probably some beneath that as well. And it is the point of connection to Earth for the International Space Station. And somebody cut the cable. And they didn't just cut it in one spot. They cut it at two locations and took about six and a half kilometers in between yeah. away. So it was pretty deliberate. And the next day, the chief of the British Defense Forces said, under any normal circumstances, this would be considered an act of war because yeah. it disconnects us from all the satellites. So that th those are some of the reasons. Correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't it, if I remember correctly, like you said, it's, it's it's a dual cable and wasn't it the case to just cut one? So basically, yeah. you, which of course, that's sort of like the, I see that as sort of the ultimate signaling, right? It's a signaling yeah. of, cap of, of military capability, basically saying like, if, if I develop the intent to harm you here, notice that I have the capability. And, and I mean, interestingly, that was, I think you said January, right, this year? Yeah. Um, that was sort of then, I think, two months after what I consider another, another demonstration of capability, which was the Russian anti-satellite test in November yeah. last year, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's the thing. It's like um, there's effectively been a war in space for some time. Um, I wish I could remember now, but I remember clocking the first anti-satellite test uh, that actually the U.S. did on its own satellite. And then there was, um, you know, a series of anti-satellite tests ever since. And in fact, just in the last few days, the U.S. has announced that it will not conduct any more anti-satellite tests because basically blowing satellites up in space destroys the orbit. It fills it with what they call the Kessler effect, which I've heard uh, uh, terrifyingly described as razor blades in a washing machine, uh, which is probably a good description of what it's like when you have all these metal shards that are in an orbit in space. So at any rate, yes, there's this sort of war in space is a very real phenomena, but because the public couldn't see it and there are no journalists in space, Yeah. Uh, only militaries really knew what was happening. But the gap between what the militaries knew and what the public knew, for me, got way too wide during the last 18 months. And that was another reason for beginning to write about it, to close the gap and limit the element of surprise for the general public. Yeah. And, and by the way, just for listeners, um, this might sound all very gloomy and scary now, what people are talking about. We'll come back to the positive, but I think the we positive will, we will. part of this. <laughs> Very soon, but but it, it it really seems like yeah you said the public can't see things which maybe happen in you know in in, in G in the G orbit or something like stuff like you know satellites uh, military satellites getting jammed or laser blinded and I understand a lot of that is 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 happening as we speak and has been happening for a while, but of course um, it seems like a lot of our you know critical infrastructure to say for lack of a better word is actually not very resilient right i mean there is not a very high number of gps satellites it's a relatively you know small constellation and uh, like you, you were just mentioning one of the, the key cables um providing satellite connectivity being one cable like a dual cable right yeah how do you think about this resilience and is, is the leadership you're talking about are they aware are we trying to improve this 
Oh, I think very much so. Um, well, again, you know, from the end of the Cold War, we got the peace dividend, which meant you didn't have to spend so much on strategic security because the Soviet Union was gone. And, you know, as Francis Fukuyama said, it was the end of history, sort of the West and capitalism and the ideals of democracy won. So we were able to divert all that capital we used to spend on, on weapons and systems and resilience into the real economy. Yeah. But then, you know, things have changed and now the superpowers are no longer uh, on good terms, to say the least. Um, and so now, yes, suddenly there's like, oh my God, we have to reinvest in all these capabilities. And that is definitely happening. But to get to the more positive side, and, you know, it is important because if we shy away from this fundamental recognition that the superpowers are at odds in space, then we're going to not understand half of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So it is quite important. And, and I do think, just to highlight two specific events, the most recent Russian anti-satellite test uh, back in November last year um, was taken as a very, as you say, overt kind of a threat. But also the Chinese with their new Shijian 17 satellite that has a robotic arm. It's almost yeah. like Pac-Man in space. Yeah. And it can, or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, the fact, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. So basically it can drop out of its orbit, get into your orbit, yeah. grab your satellite and hurl it into outer space where it no longer functions. And of course the U.S. has this capability too, but nobody else did for a long time. Yeah. So this is literally a new space race to see who has the highest who has command of the highest altitude and who has the most capability in outer space and this has been accelerated further by china announcing that they're going to put a base on the moon and yeah. of course the u.s is heading towards putting a base not only on the moon but using it as a launch pad for mars and i was recently uh out in la talking with some of the top current and former scientists um from the jet propulsion lab and you know, the idea of building a city on Mars and the moon used to just be so science fiction. And now it's being actively planned. It's actively planned. Yes. Yeah. And we'll come back to that because I think that's a really interesting area as well. And both has sort of its scary sides and it's really um, you know, sci-fi sci positive sides. It, yeah, it's funny you mentioned this sort of like satellites with the robotic arms. Um, I'm not old enough to remember this, but somebody did tell me who was a, around at the time that one of the original use cases from the for the space shuttle on the military side, and why it has this huge payload bay, was to okay. potentially hijack satellites. Yeah, so, yeah. But, well, yeah. you know, Hollywood always does a good job of capturing the future. So just go back and watch the James Bond Moonraker. And yeah. uh, there you have it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But it's like you said, then it seems like, okay, we may have had, we may, we may have or may not have had these plans for the space shuttle. Um, the last kind of thing in the olden days that I remember with uh, military thinking or capability in space was like the uh, Ronald Reagan uh, SDI, right? Yes. Days. But then, like you said, then basically the Soviet Union came to an end and it seemed like we all stopped, to, to, visibly at least to the public, we stopped caring about it and it's it's now all coming back. But um let me let me ask you about these like cities on the moon and things like that because I mean we have um, sort of the equivalent of strategic locations uh, that exist on Earth we have in space as well right and on the moon you could say for example um, and many people may not notice the moon is of course a reasonably big place of course it's smaller than the Earth but it's still a lot of space but if you look for example like the distribution of valuable raw materials like water and ice form and other things that that's actually a very very small fraction of the surface area of the moon and then there may be other strategic locations in space like what we call the Lagrange points do you do you expect us to have any potential conflicts around these strategic locations in space or how do you think things may play out there uh yeah um you know this is a very interesting subject. What shall we call it? Is it astropolitics? Is it astrogeopolitics? Um, some are using the term exopolitics. We can come to that in a minute. Uh, but what it is, is the expansion of geopolitics on Earth into the space arena. And this is already underway. Um, and we don't really have uh, an agreed set of rules about who owns what in space. And I think a very interesting question for humanity is who owns the moon? Who owns Mars? Um, and 
you know, we, we just assume it's kind of also strange that here on earth, everybody is moving away from flags and taking down statues to people who represent the colonial past. Mm. Oh, but in space, we're racing to plant flags. <laughs> imperialists. We want to be. Yeah, I mean, we are in a completely imperialist mode in space. And, and equally, here we are on Earth cleaning everything up as fast as we can. Oh, but in space, you know, we're just blowing things up, polluting it, not no regard whatsoever for the environmental impact on space. So, again, these two sides have to, there has to be a closing of the gap. And I think that will happen as we progress towards being more present in space, not just going to the moon, stepping on it and stepping away, but going and staying. And so then my question to all these folks who are true experts um, is, what are we doing on the moon? And one of the answers is, it'll be a launch pad for Mars. Mm -hmm. And that is super interesting. You know, the beginning of um, a kind of migration of humanity into the outer reaches of space. And, and by the way, you mentioned biotech. A critical piece of this is only a few weeks ago, NASA announced that they have been able to grow plants in purely lunar soil. Mm -hmm. So boom, this, this, is, this changes everything. If you can, they found water on the moon, and now you know lunar soil can grow things. Okay, now that opens up a whole bunch of possibilities, which I'm sure I'm late to the game on. I'm sure there are a whole bunch of scientists who understood this way before me. So Yeah, and a shout out to our portfolio company, Interstellar Labs from France, who are working on fully autonomous uh, greenhouses, effectively, that you mm. could use in places like the moon or mass. So this is being worked on, and, and, and NASA is involved there um, by things like the Deep uh, Space Food Project. And so this will come and very excited about that. So people, you mentioned one thing there, which was basically about the... Um, the question like who owns the moon or Mars, and I guess the question is sort of like space law and regulations in general. And of course we have things like, you know, when we, in the last golden age of space exploration, so the days of Apollo, that's obviously when, um, and many people may notice, the sort of five existing space treaties were, were born, the most prominent of which the Outer Space Treaty, which is also the one that most nations have signed up to. There is actually something called the Moon Treaty, which only very few nations have signed up to. Yeah. Now these days we have the Artemis Accords, which is probably seen very much as a uh, US-led um, initiatives. So some people are, I think, are very unlikely to ever sign up to that. Yeah. But every time somebody talks to me, and I have some friends who are space lawyers, and, and, and I love them, I think what they're doing is very interesting. But every time they tell me something like this, I'm, you know, the pragmatist in me is like, well, wh what 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 is the worth of law without enforcement? <laughs> who's yes. <in> yes. <laughs> and who's enforcing out there? So where do you think we're going with this? Because clearly we're running sort of, I'm not sure it's a risk, but sort of just factually, what's happening right now is something that happens very often in human history is that the technology, technological developments and sort of facts like the fait accompli, as the French say, may run ahead of things like the law and politics. Um, always does. Always okay. does. Um, having, again, you know, worked uh, in the White House and, and at the highest levels of a G7 government, by definition, technology will exceed the what the law has to say about anything. And so, yeah, this question is, is this just a, is this just a Wild West free for all and whoever gets there first and can defend their territory, quote, wins? Um, and is that how humanity wants to make its progress in space? Space. And let's understand who is going and for what reason. One of the most interesting things for me is that Luxembourg has emerged as a center for asteroid mining, space yeah. mining, right? And there's talk about a wild west, you know, um, literally every asteroid, they start trying to put a value on it, you know, and some of them they practically exceed the GDP of nations. There, there's so much there. And that's a real phenomena. I mean, there are guys at NASA who have the title that they are in charge of asteroid mining, right? This is, again, no longer science fiction. This is a real phenomena. So can we imagine that humans start, you know, grabbing valuable materials in space? Yes. And then are governments going to try to protect the interests of their people grabbing those assets? Yes. Um, so I can see that the space space 
is a contested space now and will be more contested as we find more valuable things and we're more able to be present in, in space, for sure. And by the way, the fact that you even said space lawyers, I mean, if I give a lecture on what's going on in the world economy and I say a whole new sector is space lawyers, most people would burst out laughing. But it is a new sector. It is actually something people are going to get paid a fortune if they can figure out how to navigate in the legalities of space. Yeah, my, my sort of cynical comment, of course, sometimes is that they, are, they only invented the space lawyer concept so finally lawyers could sound cool. Who do we want in space first? Do we want the lawyers and the miners and the military? Because right now that's who's showing up. And yeah. I do think there's a question for humanity about how should humanity progress into space? Um, and And this is a huge... It's literally like the humanitarian question of our generation. I okay, let's come back. Let's come back to that in two questions. I just want to finish up on the sort of the, the, the sort of legal and regulatory stuff. So so I guess we have sort of two ways we can go. One is we actually try to hammer out some sort of um, you know multilateral um, modus operandi, maybe sort of like a reformed um, outer space treaty or something like that. I don't just don't know how likely that is in the current geopolitical environment. You know, I would have been I would have been cynical about that like a year ago, and right now it seems. So are we moving towards something that is just going to be sort of like a game theoretic um, balance of powers? You know, I, I'm not going to screw up the Chinese operation because I don't have any interest in them retaliating. Or is, is that what we're moving? to you think i think that's what we're in um yeah. i think that's what we're in and i say that uh, advisedly my my father was economic advisor to four presidents but he was tom Schelling's research assistant who won the nobel for game theory sure. so so yeah we are in a game theory situation for sure um and no nobody's going to agree to anything in space right this is not just a wild competition, but we're going to see, the question is, what will happen if one of the superpowers directly attacks another one in space? So far, they have all cleverly aimed at their own equipment, right? So the, 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 the Russians blew up their own aging weather satellite. The yeah. Chinese blow up their own old weather satellite. Even the Americans, you know, when we go to aim at a satellite, what we love to do is not blow the whole satellite up, but just take a little piece of it off, which shows that we have far greater uh, precision with our aim <laughs> than the Russians and the yeah. Chinese. Yes. Um, if you'll excuse my my saying this, but it's it's like a pissing match, you know. It's just literally uh, you're kind of yes. like there's boys with their toys, and they are, and. Is this how we're going to continue? Because at some point, there will be an event that does impact on Earth. Mm. And that will be probably the moment we all realize that um, this is a very, very big situation, a big problem. We already had, I mean, arguably we had that, right? I mean, I would I would argue that the Viasat hack, of course, the Russians yes. are denying it, but I would argue the Viasat hack was such a you know, sovereign attack on space, well, the, yeah. the, the terrestrial part of space infrastructure, right? Yeah. Well, and again, let's remember that here on Earth, almost all the weapon systems are driven by satellite guidance, yeah. right? So one of the threats that uh, is implicit is each of the superpowers has the capacity to take out the other side's satellites. And I think that's been known for many years, which is partly what's driven, there are many things, but one of the things that's driven the, the US in particular to move away from huge, juicy targets that yes. are military satellites that are enormous and you hit that thing and you're done and instead work with the private sector to introduce these tiny little shoebox sized satellites, um, which now are becoming increasingly ubiquitous, but they're becoming ubiquitous so fast. And as you know, China's already come out and said, well, we think that Starlink is the military. Yes. So who is the military and who isn't the military is a open question in space as well. Exactly. And that was actually going to be my next question about Starlink because of course, and not only the Chinese, right? It was quite of kind of evident from certain comments on, 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 on the social networks, like by for example by Rogozin, the head of Roscosmos. Yes, and yes. They're they are kind of annoyed. Kind of. <laughs> kind of putting it putting it very mildly. Yeah, it's just continuing British expressions that got their knickers in a twist or something. That's it. That's it. And um, by the way, an important aside here is I've noticed in, in the last decade, the Chinese 
in particular, but the Russians as well, systematically train their military to operate with no electricity, no sat nav, no mm. satellites, no anything electronic. And the Chinese are really good at it now. The Americans and, the, and NATO, they do from time to time, give it a try, but fundamentally, all of our weapon systems and the NATO US side of things completely depend on electricity and satellites. Yes. So that's a that's a huge issue and you know huge issue in space. So the electricity part in combat theaters we'll, we'll actually come back to that because I think that's that there's some very interesting potential space applications that you also highlighted in, in yes. some of your articles. Yes, power sources. Power sources exactly. But just fin finishing up on the sort of Starlink and so the other you, you mentioned a few minutes ago sort of like we have to think about how we actually want to progress into space, right? And of course it's interesting that you know we have talked about so far a lot about the role of effectively sovereign like nation states right and like russia and china and the us and how they act of course one interesting wrinkle of the space sector the space space is that so much is at the moment driven by one private company and spacex like 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 starling for example right of course with material financial help from from the us government but it's still a private company now with regard to expanding into space like let's say mars for the lack of a better um, example um, mm -hmm. But it's obviously a prominent example because that's what's on Elon's mind. We now probably facing the very real scenario that the first people to set foot on mass, it, it might be a company. Yes. Nation state. That's right. How, how, does, how does that impact things? And do you think nation states may tolerate this? Like, is that, I mean, how big may nation states allow like a SpaceX, say, driven settlement to grow on Mars before the US government or somebody else may just say, okay, the next few Starship flights, that's going to be... Um, U.S. Space Force, and by the way, we were establishing a garrison. Well, this is the right set of questions to ask. It is. Um, and I, could it be that, um, they tr that somebody might say, well, let's take it out before it gets there and can establish the garrison? Yes. Is that, is that a possibility? Maybe. Um, you know, space has also been, uh, how do I put this? Space has been a space where there was an immense amount of freedom to do what you wanted. Mm. And one of its attractions to the commercial players is that there are no rules and there are no uh, regulators effectively. So they can do all kinds of stuff that you can't do on Earth. Now, the positive side of this um, are two new forms of power that I think are being developed. One is uh, space-based solar power, and the other is testing nuclear capability in space, by which I don't mean uh, weapons and bombs. I mean power plants, nuclear power plants that can be operated. And you're hearing now a lot of the space craft designers are talking about nuclear powered wind sails um fleets of basically robotics you know it's funny because i look at this as someone who was in the world of manufacturing aerial drones it's yeah. just the altitudes are getting higher right <laughs> but it's still yeah. the same thing it's robotics that can extend their reach into the into very far distant locations and if you could power that with a nuclear source or use solar, or you can harness solar energy in space, then you can have an army for either your mining company or your military. And we need to think about that. Do we want to project armies that are commercial, that are, again, how is humanity going to show up? in outer space is a big question. Yeah, so I would say, again, I guess trying to reflect phrase this more, um, so less militaristic or justifying the military presence so people don't, some of our listeners don't get upset that we're sort of both like military connected people here. Right, right, um, okay. Um, you know, you can look, you could look at the, for example, the US Navy as a potentially aggressive force. And of course, you know, aircraft carriers have been used, you know, to in, 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 in combat situations, you know, but another way in which I look at the US Navy is basically um, securing the ocean freight routes and hence yes, a large yes. part of the world economy. And that's, Definitely. that's also a way I look at the US Space Force that you know, yes. the more and more assets we have up there and the more and more trade we're happening, it, it needs some protection. I 100% concur with that. I don't think the Russians and Chinese will concur with that, uh, but I agree. And that's right. Freedom of navigation has always been central to um, 
the activities of the United States government, um, and it deploys the Navy in the in the seas. Um, but in space, this is one reason you're seeing the ramping up of the Space Force. And here's a question. Are we going to need a Coast Guard of outer space? Mm. where they enforce the rules, where they stop the gun runners, where they, um, you know, deal with pirates. I mean, are we going to have pirates in space? I would say yeah, at this rate, yeah, we are. So yeah, are we going to need a, and should that Coast Guard, is that going to be an American, call it the Space Guard, maybe? Will it be American or will it be like the UN, a peacekeeping force in space? These are open questions humanity has never had to face before. And I, I think they're fascinating and important and worthy of our time and energy. Yeah. And I mean, at the extreme, it may even, I mean, this, this might be a stretch of imagination, it may even be a corporate force, right? If there's a, a lot of assets up there. But do you think you mentioned sort of the, the concept of denying capability? So, you know, um, in terms of like the Stalin capability, I mean, I'm optimistically saying as a Westerner that that the Chinese and Russians may have lost the battle there already because there's something like 2,000 satellites. And of course, they're not all covering the same area, but there's probably a lot of redundancy up there already. Is there other sort of areas of up and coming capability where you would be worried that adversaries may be um, attempting to sabotage? Or, and I'm also saying that in the context of, I recently read somewhere, a totally different field, but um, there was somebody alleging that uh, Chinese entities were actively sabotaging rare earth projects outside of China to yeah. maintain advantage yeah 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 well look if we are you know again I come back to are we in world war three um and if we are and it's occurring in places you can't see which mainly means space the high seas this is very much a submarine uh conflict environment which then you'll never know what's been going on um and you know yeah is this a world where sabotage is occurring mm, yeah this is probably part of what's going on i mean the cutting of the internet cable was an act of sabotage yeah. and still nobody can say who did it right it's this no fingerprints kind of situation and similarly um i think it was back in um february this year when starlink launched uh, a whole bunch of satellites and i think 40 or more of them uh came down and the official story is it was a geomagnetic geomagnetic okay, storm. storm yes we, was it well we don't know uh but given the position of russia and china on it maybe maybe right so again when you're in a when you're in a hot war which i think we are right this is not a cold war I've argued we're in a hot war in cold places, and that hot war is in space, and it's underwater, um, and so it nonetheless is a hot war. And so your question is right. I don't know is the answer, but it, it, it would be a surprise to me if the U.S. just makes huge progress into space and China and Russia say and do nothing. Yeah, yeah. It's something that, that I've been thinking about. I think we're fine now on like a number of the satellites. So on satellite communications, optimistically, maybe we're fine. I do think we probably need a much more resilient uh, GNSS, like a navigational network, yes. and startups are working on that. And then I wonder whether there's a bottleneck. And, and so the other thing, of course, is let's say they do manage to destroy a number of satellites. You want like the, the rapid response sort of like a capability of, of replacing them, right? And there are sometimes wonder whether we are too constrained on launch sites, but that's sort of a topic by its. Well, that's actually a good point. And notice that new launch sites are being built. Uh, the one I'm keeping an eye on is the new one in the UK in the Shetland Islands. Yes. Uh, and, you know, from a Russian perspective, Britain is just the forward arm of the US military, yeah. right? It's um, uh, and so they're keeping a close eye on that too. But look again, technology is it's improving so quickly. Um, and what we should be paying attention to as well is what's happening in space that might things make make things much better here on Earth. And again, the two things I'm really interested in are space-based solar power, and everybody is racing to get that to happen. The Chinese are putting up a an array of mirrors on a satellite that they say will be a mile wide. And it captures the rays of the sun, beams them to earth. And traditionally this was seen as a weapon system because you can zap things on earth with, with this capability. But because of what's happened to oil prices and the war in Ukraine and its impact, 
actually militaries are starting to say, you know, we could turn this around and use it as a power source. Yes. And now NASA just a few weeks ago announced, see, one of the problems is if you've got a beam that's that powerful and it's coming to Earth, yeah. it's basically going to blow up, incinerate whatever it is, is going to hit. So NASA announced they've come up with a new diamond-based coating that will allow you to capture the power without destroying the machinery that is capturing it. And I could easily see that in 10 or 15, maybe 15 years, the whole question about oil goes away and we'll all be having unlimited space-based solar power. Well, on, on the power generation side, we have, we have to figure out what we do with the plastics in our lives. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 definitely. That's another thing, yes. yes. But, but yeah, I agree. So it's but that's a super interesting um, area and, and for benefit of our listeners, Probably about 20 episodes or so ago, I had as a guest um, retired Colonel um, Dr. Coyote Smith uh, from the U.S. Air Force, who was working on um, space-based solar power for the U.S. Uh-huh. military yeah. about 15 years ago. It might be interesting for you, Pippa, as well, because there was apparently some phase about 15 years ago when the U.S. military was very interested already in space-based solar power. A number of reports were written, but it kind of seemed to go away again. And now, actually, like you mentioned, it seems to have come back. And I think it's publicly known that there is... Um, I think it's a microwave transmission experiment is one of the things being flown on currently on the X-37B U.S. Space Force space plane. Um, There again, it's it's interesting, right, because it could be also something where you have an application which has a clear military side as well, which could then help out to basically uh, get us to the commercial non-military applications, right? Completely. And that's what I see is actually the circumstances on Earth have become uh, so overwhelming with high energy prices that actually militaries are now going to commercialize technologies that they've had for a long time. So the ability to use space-based solar power as a directed energy weapon is one thing, but Mm -hmm. actually turn it around and commercialize it and allow your your populations to have free energy. That's uh, a national security objective met. And similarly, if you can basically harvest energy in space, again, then you, all sorts of things can happen in space that you couldn't consider before. And one of them that I think is going to be super interesting is space-based sports. <laughs> and literally, people are already talking about space surfing, you know, like space skateboarding. Like literally, if you can power small craft, are humans going to want to go up there and basically whiz around? Yeah, totally, they are. <laughs> So I think that's another one. And finally, nuclear. And nuclear is maybe the most important and most interesting. How do you create nuclear power? So you have a permanent energy supply on the moon or on Mars. Um, And for a long time, the US military, I think, has had a technology, these mini nuclear reactors that are like Mm -hmm. six feet by six feet by six feet. And they can power, um, you know, 5,000 homes for like five years. But that was never commercialized because, number one, the regulations in nuclear are so severe. It would take you 20 years to get through the regulatory process. It just costs too much. But if you can prove that it works in space, then it becomes easier to deploy it on Earth. And I think that that's also coming. And Rolls-Royce engines, there's loads of news about Rolls-Royce engines work in this field of tiny nuclear reactors. And, and it's interesting, and there's actually also, and this is publicly known, that parts of the U.S. military um, are looking at sort of um, not only fission, but even miniaturized nuclear fusion, proposed nuclear fusion devices, which could, of course, make a huge difference as a power source, but then also for um, propulsion in space, because it would be an incredible, if it would make it work, an incredibly efficient uh, and powerful way of propulsion, right? Both um, uh, high efficiency, what we call specific. Completely. Completely. Us. And as a sh- shout out to our portfolio company, um, Helicity Space at this point, which is working uh-huh. on. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. there's one thing about this that does concern me, and that is, um, don't know if you know about Starfish Prime. Do you remember Starfish Prime? So in 1962, um, the U.S let off a high altitude nuclear test. And it was said to be, it was in the Johnson Atoll, you know, in the middle of the Pacific, where they thought, you know, nobody cares. It's the middle of nowhere, Um, um, leaving aside the poor islanders. But at any rate, they let off a bomb that it apparently was a thousand times larger than Hiroshima. And effectively it was the first test of an EMP device, I think. 
Um, and I think they did five of them, and one of them is known as Starfish Prime. Now, I can understand, you know, when you're experimenting with new technology, you want to test the limits. But because space doesn't have any, well, it has more eyes in it now because cameras are up there, but it doesn't have any rules and it doesn't really have any regulations. So is there going to be a temptation to try things that are fundamentally dangerous and maybe not a good idea? just because you can. Yeah. And I wonder whether this is smart. You know, does humanity want to say, oh, well, just like we said, the South Pacific Islands, we're like, nobody lives there. That's far away. We can blow the thing sky high. Well, in retrospect, the amount of damage done was so severe and who knows what impact it had ultimately on the planet. Um, and we, we, we don't know. So should we go blowing things up when we don't really know the consequences? Yeah, but people, that it leaves us in sort of an interesting dilemma, doesn't it? Because, you know, you and I and many people in our part of, well, in our part of the geopolitical world may think like that, right? But I see that, so the risk of that is a similar risk, which we're also already seeing in a totally different arena, right? In artificial intelligence, right? So where I think there's a risk that strategic competitors who don't care about privacy and hence have much more data may leap ahead of us, right? Do you see the same risk here that you know, maybe we care about, you know, being careful, like putting up nuclear devices in space, but then maybe some strategic competitors, they're like, they won't care at all and may get a leg up on us? A hundred percent. And in fact, look at artificial intelligence. We've just seen um, one of the artificial intelligence programmers at Google went, um, excuse me, but the AI I'm working on seems to be becoming sentient. And he's now all over the net explaining how the AI he developed started to take on real thinking characteristics. And so, and it's created quite a kerfuffle. Google fired him and, yeah, yeah. you know, it's really interesting to see even, you're right, here on earth, we are testing the limits of what's possible and taking significant risks. I mean, remember when um, the Manhattan Project first happened and they were the scientists were building the first nuclear weapon, there was a period when they actually believed that it might set the entire atmosphere of Earth on fire. And mm. they decided to go ahead and do it anyway. Yes. <laughs> You're like, Now, are we glad they did it? You know, has nuclear been a benefit to humanity? Yeah. But boy, I don't know if I want to take that kind of risk again in space and say, yeah, let's just check it out and see what happens. Like, maybe we should be a little more circumspect. Maybe, again, all of humanity should have a say. Uh, I don't know how you do it. But yeah. it's about creating a culture of space. Uh, you know, it's not about rules and regulations. It's more about the culture of protecting the outer environment in which Earth happens to exist. And that attitude, I agree, some won't have it, but humanity will not um, take kindly if, if kind of that, that, that approach persists. It'll force people to the negotiating table that otherwise wouldn't have arrived. Yeah, we just, yeah we, I guess we just have to be really careful coming back to game theory that we don't end up in sort of a multiplayer prisoner's dilemma here where uh, yeah, yeah. everybody has to go to the lowest common denominator and... Uh, you end up things that we then as as humanity will then regret. I totally agree with you. Let me ask you one more sort of question on the geopolitics slash military side before I promise we finally get to sort of the positive it's side. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> so we've talked a lot about sort of the action in space and uh, you know what people might be doing in space in places like in high orbits, the moon, Mars. Now, another interesting effect, of course, is that a lot of this space technology can have impacts right here on Earth, including again strategic capabilities and just in no particular order, some examples I can think of is, you know, uh, hypersonic technology, right? And yes. the military importance of many people who know the Russians have used for the first time in combat their hypersonic missiles called the Kinshal. Um, the Chinese, I think last year or the year before, demonstrated a hypersonic glide, glide vehicle. I think they denied that, but we know they did. They did. Um, but it doesn't even have to be weapons, right? It could just be, you know, um, you were mentioning, uh, we were talking before we started on biotech, which was in the context of in-space manufacturing, um, which is, you know, we're very excited about as an investment fund that microgravity manufacturing has a lot of use cases. Another exactly. thing we can do there is uh, some people are working on is advanced semiconductors, which might wean us off the whole like kind of dependency on certain parts of the world. And again, sort of like would shift the strategic 
balance around. And then there's other examples like solar space based solar power you talked about. How do you see sort of that impact of space technology right here on Earth and how that's shifting around the strategic balance and some of the maybe even unintended consequences that might have? Yeah, no, space manufacturing is going to be massive. And so there are a number of things that you can make in space because of the zero gravity environment that are harder to do on Earth. For example, a, one that has been known about a long time is fiber optic cables. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that when there's gravity, you tend to get little air bubbles in the, in the fiber optics, in the glass. But if you do it in space, no bubbles. And that means much faster transmission. And because, look, we, we 3D printed the first three-dimensional object in space in 2014. And so we've been advancing with 3D printing in space really, really fast. And uh, I think, yeah, we're going to be able to make things you couldn't make on Earth. And one area that I don't know very much about, but I heard someone uh, in, the, in the medical field talking about this the other day, which is the ability to make certain um, drug compounds in space that don't combine in a gravity environment, but you can combine them in a zero gravity environment. And I couldn't tell you more about that, but I've started to explore space medicine, which isn't just about treating astronauts yeah. it's about making medicines that you use here on earth which is just fascinating yes yes and there's certainly a number of use cases we're looking at in the venture fund you're absolutely right um for drug development um tissue engineering there is a number of yeah. very potential use cases and that frankly we've known about for a while because we did all of the experiments they just uh, they just never made any economic sense and right right and right cost to start making economic sense so so talking okay so now we're kind of shifting actually automatically with, with segueing into the more positive side effects right so in space manufacturing and what it might do for for example drug developments is one example um and and, and of course you know we have seen other sort of non-military space applications develop and private financing flow into this but there's so much to do now right if the space the space space really takes off and we're taking advantage of, you know, the special conditions we find in space and making taking advantage of much lower launch costs and operating costs in space. Do you think we have everything that takes to develop the space economy or do you see any sort of bottlenecks anywhere? And I have my view and we can talk about it, but it's stuff like, you know, political willingness, which I hope is there, funding availability, um, uh, sufficient number of entrepreneurs, a sufficient amount of workforce as well, things like that. Would do, do you think we have everything in place? Well, <laughs> we have labor shortages here on Earth, so <laughs> and we definitely don't have a whole lot of people with space expertise. Like it's a pretty rarefied uh, field, but it is expanding fast. And I think the more we the more we help a regular person understand that space is no longer science fiction, it's real, the more we'll attract the right talent to work on these projects. Meanwhile, governments are spending record sums of money on uh, defense and on space. And look, defense spending is kind of the new quantitative easing, as we say in the world of economics, yeah. right? You, it's the way you can generate a ton of money and nobody asks any questions because it's for defense. And when I speak to people in the defense community and they're like, well, I'm not getting it. You know, I don't know where it's going. Where is it going? It's going on a few key things. And one of them is supercomputers and quantum computers, mm -hmm. which are necessary because space requires enormous amount of computational power. It does. Um, and modern defense requires an enormous amount of computational power. Uh, it's going on space, rockets, satellites, everything that we've been talking about. And so I think that, honestly, the space space is massively supported with cash for decades to come. The danger is that there's an accident. And of course, that is what caused the space program to to kind of falter in the mid 1980s was the Challenger aircraft accident and you know Congress isn't going to allocate money to NASA if they're going to kill school teacher um, right. and you know on on global television and so that was one thing that led to the creation of so many private sector space companies was that NASA couldn't get funding any longer and they decided to focus on the science and let the manufacturing be done by private players that were better at precision manufacturing anyway. Now that that's proved to be a success, this will hold true until there's an accident. And if there's an accident that kills a human, then you can be sure there's going to be a big pause again. And so 
we're vulnerable to a technological accident more than anything in the space space. Yeah, I mean, see, part of me agrees, and I think it would definitely, let's say if it was a space tourism endeavor, like if one of yeah. the space tourism rockets, like the suborbital rockets, for example, crashes, I think that would probably kill the company who crashes yeah. it. Yeah. I hope it's not going to, because of because of the strategic importance, I really hope we're going to mature enough that it wouldn't derail everything, because again, that would sort of yeah. give strategic competitors a very, an advantage they would very much welcome if we were to, you know, um, cautious around that, I suppose. Absolutely. Um, you should try not to kill people. I fully agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you should try. Yeah. But by the way, it's ridiculous because what we're saying, the bar is so high. I mean, the auto industry kills how many people every single yeah. year, right? Like, look, when you're trying to push the boundaries of human capability, you're going to have accidents and somebody will get killed sooner or later in the process. We can't say that that one thing should stop everything. And to be honest, the space program or humanity's ability to expand into space has only accelerated since the Challenger blew up. It's just that the institutions doing it changed. And yeah. I think that's more what would be likely to happen. And again, this is why we should think about what are the implications of humanity stretching into space in this in this new way. Um, and with that, maybe I can raise something that's super controversial, like ridiculously Please. controversial. We like controversial things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, it's such a tricky subject, but I do think it's very interesting that the U.S. Congress has just held the first hearings in 50 years on uh, no longer are they called UFOs. Now they're called UAPs, UAPs right? Yeah. Unidentified aerial phenomena. Yeah. The yeah. fact that they have renamed this phenomena and are now declassifying all of the records from, I don't know, however long it is. It is very interesting. Now, there are different ways we could look at this. We could say that if you if you can say there's life beyond humanity, there's life in space, it justifies endless spending, right? There's no limit anymore. Uh, even just from a defense perspective, then there's no limit on the spending. And if we come back to the growing a lunar plant, technically that means there is going to be life in space, right? Just the plant. But yeah. if there's life even beyond a plant, then we just got a free pass for unlimited spending in space. Now, if it isn't that it's just a, a, a story that's being made up to justify defense spending, if there is actually something to it, and if we're finding that all these astronauts who have been in space have come back and said, well, I, you know, actually something happened to me, but I wasn't allowed to say, and now they're able to tell their stories, then we're going to have a level of engagement of all the humans here on Earth with the story of space in a very, very different way. And I think, look, the scientists in places like JPL and, and you know, the, the rocket launch centers, they may all go, oh, well, that's all ridiculous. That's just nonsense. Maybe. But humanity has always had two core technologies. And one of them is math and numbers. And mm. they specialize in that. And the other is stories. Yes. And stories are a powerful technology. And if the story of space starts to be redefined as something where we're not alone, that alone, even if it's not true, the story will matter for how space develops. Oh, I, I fully agree. And it's actually a way, you know, you were complaining, and I think I was about to complain that we have still a shortage of, you know, workers in space. And it's kind of, and I see it anecdotally across the board, but right? I see it on a technical level with our portfolio companies, but I also see it, you know, we just need a, the general public to be more aware of space, right? And what's going on. And, you know, if some sort of, and you're right, some people will not like us saying that, but if some sort of UFO angle, sorry, UAP angle sort of gets more people excited to read up on space, that's actually helpful, very helpful. Sort of like complementing the you know the, the sci-fi, the Star, Star Trek, Star Wars uh, expanse. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, it's uh, it's super interesting watching all these. Um, I mean, there's a whole race between Russia, China, and the U.S. with regard to their UAP information. Um, and you know, all sides are saying, well, we have our stories too, and we have our evidence, and we have our this and our that. Um, so. It's, it's something is definitely going on on that front, but it's very hard to pin it down. I do think from a, I mean, having worked for the U.S. government myself, I, I worked under 
you know, I've worked for two presidents. Like I said, my dad has worked for four. It's very strange watching the U.S. government begin to do things like declassifying documents, like giving um, immunity to senior former government officials so that they can talk about this. So something is up, but I'm not sure what. Yeah, I mean, let's hope that as more information gets out there and there's more eyes up there and there's more sort of interest of people who start analyzing data and thinking about it, that we will get, we'll get more certainty around things. Um, I did want to ask you one question, uh, sort of, uh, this is kind of balancing this, all of this geopolitical competition we talk about with the more positive stuff. And like you already alluded to it, like some of this, some really positive um, impact use cases for space, like, you know, uh, climate management, right? Of yes. course, monitoring climate change and possibly also climate management. Um, and then, okay, maybe not a positive use case, but a necessary one is sort of uh, planetary defense, right? You know, if we get threatened by an asteroid or something. And those types of use cases ideally would require global cooperation, right? Because if we splinter, that's it, it may just make it more complex. But do you, do you think we will be able to do that? Or how do you see that playing well, this out? Is, this is, again, <laughs> this is one of those wonderful questions. Was it Gorbachev, I think, who said to Ronald Reagan something along the lines of, you know, if there were, you know, if, if aliens existed and we were under attack, we would align with the United States, right? That was kind of the assumption back in the 80s, you know, when I was in the White House, I remember that. Um, is it true today? Okay, it's like if somebody is would it say true like, today? Oh, yeah. Sorry, we're, we're gonna align with the we're gonna align with the aliens against you. Yeah, like you know, or or you know, it, this is where exopolitics is so interesting. Which is technically that's the politics of dealing with life beyond humanity, right? And could we? I mean, there are a zillion conspiracy theories, right, which are going to boil away in the background on this. But <laughs> if if it is the case that something exists out there, could there be a jockeying to see who creates the first alignment, right? At the expense of the others. Is it possible? <laughs> I suppose it is. I mean, I laugh and I, I don't mean to because this is a serious subject. My uh, my mother, while well, my dad worked for Tom Schelling on game theory, my mom was J.R.R. Tolkien's research assistant because she spoke Middle English uh, uh, back in the late- combination between math and, and stories. Yeah, <laughs> math and stories. And- um, you know, she she used to talk about the process of world building. And there's a wonderful word for this. It's called cosmopoesis. Nobody mm -hmm. uses this word, right? I've never seen this word. I've never heard this word used by a live human. But I found it. And I, I think it captures the essence of what is happening now in space. We are building a world, a, 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 con a concept of how humanity is going to present itself in space. And we don't know yet what we'll find out there, but we haven't really figured out how, how would we present ourselves if we did bump in to somebody else, mm. right? How, how would that look? Would that be just a free for all scramble? I'm the right guy to talk to. No, 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 no. Talk to me. No, 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 no. Look at me. Yeah. Right? Could that be? <laughs> yeah. So the sort, the sort of stereotypical science fiction uh, sort of question when the UFO shows up, right? It's like, take me to your leader. That's not a very clear answer. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Anyway, I don't want to belabor the point, but even in the absence of life existing in space, and by the way, I think it's so fascinating. There's the, there's the new James Webb telescope telling us there are 2 billion galaxies like our own. So, you know, what are the probabilities? But even if it doesn't exist, we still have the question of how is humanity going to show up in space and with what purpose? So everything that's focused on saving the planet that we live on now, I see wonderful things there. Ocean management, um, being able to detect you know, seismic uh, activity on Earth more accurately. Um, there are all sorts of amazing things, including, by the way, the discovery of ancient civilizations, which is only possible because of space photography. Um, and by the way, a whole new a whole new sector in the space space is space is space camouflage. In other words, how do you camouflage things on Earth from the ubiquitous satellite cameras, right? So now that we can see everything on the planet, you can be sure people are going to spend a fortune trying to hide stuff. Um, so that's a whole other like, sector in the economy that's developing because of the ubiquity of the cameras in space. That's actually going to be a really 
I mean, the sort of the uh, the person in me who has academic AI background, that's going to be a really interesting artificial intelligence problem because it's, it's basically talking about tricking artificial intelligence. Totally, the totally. <laughs> that's Definitely. <laughs> exactly. So um, let me let me wrap let, wrap up here. We typically finish up with a um, question on science fiction and favorite science fiction. And I think we're sort of like segueing into that anyway, as we're talking about the word you just mentioned, I already forgot, cosmo, what was it? Cosmo Cosmopoesis. Cosmopoesis. Yes. And, and sort of like world building um, in space and societies we might build. And um, do you have any sort of favorite science science fiction visions about what the future looks like? Oh, well, what what amazes me and I find wonderful is how science fiction always shows us the future well before we get there um, from Jules Verne, you know, and how is it? Is it because one person with imagination shows us basically engages in cosmopoiesis and then all of our scientists and our mathematicians and our technical people start to build what they've been shown? Is that yeah. how it works? In which case, we need many, many more people with great imaginations so yeah. that we can direct our builders to follow that blueprint. Um, and uh, by the way, that reminds me, we didn't even get into the issue of uh, genetics in space and the impact of space on human genetics. That's a huge Yeah, or deal. things we may do on purpose to adapt yes. ourselves, right? Which then, again, could be another area where, you know, there might be some people who will be really, for the, for the right reasons, cautious about it and other people who may just do it, right? And, Completely. Yeah. And here's another weird angle. Will we create aliens. In other words, if we know that space has a certain uh, deleterious effect on the human physique, the brain, the bones, could you engineer a human that could withstand space better than a regular human? Like you literally create a, yeah. a different kind of human. I'm sure that's coming too. So anyway, yeah, what, what I really love actually are reading the scientists of previous eras who had a conflicting point of view about reality and, and who were dismissed as, you know, crazy and didn't make sense. Um, I, to me, that's not science fiction. That's just alternative science. Right. And like right now, you know, for ever, I don't know, for what, 200 years, we haven't been very interested in um, electromagnetic fields and magnetism because uh, Mesmer kind of disgraced the field because he got into, you know, psychology and, and um, the concept of using electricity to heal humans. And it was just so wacky and weird that ever since then, it's been dismissed. Mm. But actually, once you're in space, electromagnetic fields are a commonplace issue that you have to contend with. So I think that's just as interesting as science fiction as the scientists who said, hey, wait a minute, but they got dismissed. Yes. And now yes. they're kind of coming back to the fore again. Yes, that is su super interesting. Um, so you wrote two parts of your space space article so far. I think I saw somewhere you were teasing another one. Is, is that I gonna... am teasing another one and I haven't written it yet. Uh, I'm in the process of writing it now. So it'll be a three part piece. Um, so yeah, two parts are out now <laughs> on Substack. I have the column on Substack. Yeah, and again, we will put the link in the episode notes. I'm very Thank much you. looking forward to, to the third one. Paper, it's been an absolute pleasure you know as we said before i think we could go on here for another three hours but <laughs> those of you who are listening on their commute or in the gym you know, yeah we have a three-hour episode so here we are for this time and maybe we'll do another one and continue this at some point in time but it was an absolute pleasure and thank you so much for being on thank you for having me and good luck with all your investments in space thank you and that's a wrap for another nominal episode of the Space Business Podcast. Once more, if you enjoyed this, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple or Spotify. You can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. You can support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. Lastly, if you have any feedback, including ideas for guests, and that may include yourself if you have an interesting space story to tell, or interested in being a sponsor, drop us an email at spacebusinesspodcast at gmail.com. See you for the next episode.